So, uh, again, as I was saying, thank you so much, everyone, to be here. We really appreciate your your, your attention and your participation today. Um, and uh, please, uh, in the conversation with David, he he prefers and wants a more interactive back and forth conversation. And that will be very valuable for the recording for, for the folks that cannot join us today who have an interest on, on the good, the bad, the challenges uh, of using GIS in, in higher education. So uh, today we're very, very lucky to have uh, Dave Murray as our guest speaker. Uh, he has a very interesting and very uh, um, productive uh, trajectory in GIS as, as I have asked him to to put a slide with his background. And I said, please don't be humble, put the whole thing, it's important for people to, to know about your work. Uh, but briefly, I, I would say that, that Dave is, is, is extremely passionate about GIS science and technology on one side, his whole career. He's very passionate also about planning and also about education. He's teaching in the Department of, of Geography, uh, of uh, uh, geographic science and technology uh, certificate in the Department of Civil Engineering as well as Geography in the University of Colorado Denver and he has been doing this above and beyond the call of duty uh, you know mentoring students working with with people and this is uh, you know above you know during the nights and the weekends really literally because he's full-time uh, 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 coordinator, GIS coordinator for the city of Westminster here in the Denver area in Colorado in the USA. So uh, Dave, uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule to be with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if you could please take it away uh, and then, yeah. oh, one, one more thing. Uh, and Dave will from, from then on explain the thing, but he, he will prefer uh, later as he do his presentation or during his presentation that you guys ask questions, but he will, he will now manage uh, how he wants to conduct the conversation. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Raphael. I truly, truly appreciate that. Let me share my screen. Uh, get that uh, cooking. Uh, view. Oh. Full page, full screen mode. Okay. So I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, this is the challenges and opportunities of instructing a university level FOS4G course. And it is being presented uh, through the, the great auspices of geo for all uh, I'm Dave Murray, um, GISP. I have a GIS professional certi cer certification. Um, I am, uh, during the day, I'm the GIS coordinator for the city of Westminster, Colorado, and I'm also a lecturer at the University of Colorado at Denver. And um, I just want to give you a quick overview, a little bit about my background and my motivations uh, for instructing these courses. Um, and then jump into the course and really um, talk about who's for, um, how I go about preparing for it, what works, what doesn't work, um, and, and really the future. And I'm really here to learn from you. And, um, you know, we all help each other. Uh, and we were, all, we were all here to benefit our students. So, um, let me move on a little bit. So my, my personal background, as, as Raphael said, um, I uh, hold the following degrees. I have a bachelor's of mechanical engineering technology from the University of Northern Arizona. I have a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Colorado at Denver, and a master's in engineering in GIS from the University of Colorado at Denver. And in 2007, I received my GISP. So for the last 18 years, I have been the GIS coordinator for the city of Westminster, Colorado. It is a suburb of Denver, Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado USA, um, as well as um, for the last 22 years, and it was 1998 that I first started um, my career as an adjunct at the University of Colorado at Denver. And I've also been a lecturer there. Um, I've instructed full GIS semester courses in civil engineering and the geography department. 
And the last six years, um, I have been privileged to be able to instruct a FOS4G course in geography and environmental sciences. And here is my contact information. You can contact me at dmurray at cityofwestminster.us or david.murray at ucdenver.edu. So, um, you know, I want to make this disclaimer first off, um, you know, and, and this is really not so much a dis disclaimer, but um, just about something about my background. I really, really do believe it is a privilege to instruct students. We are guiding the next uh, cohort of professionals uh, in our industry. And as one professor said, um, we're going to have to be working with a lot of these people. So we want to make sure that they are um, trained and they are knowledgeable in, in, in the science and the practice of, of uh, geographic information. Um, and I am here because I think com competition is important for our industry. Having just one view of geography um, does not tell the complete story. Um, uh, I use a limited amount of Phos4G in my daily work, though when properly integrated, it can improve processes tremendously. Um, I use it in my coursework and it really does help me become a better GIS professional. And I certainly do not claim to be an expert in Phos4G, but I find it fascinating and I try to do my best. So we're all here to learn, to learn together. So really, why, why a separate FOS4G class? Um, to get a real balanced understanding of the capabilities of geospatial. Um, you know, it is such a broad world of uh, learning experiences and technologies that just one view of it cannot cover it. Um, and, and really, we're here to challenge the assumptions provided by vendors, and they should be uh, thankful for that because that only makes their products better. Strengthen the core understanding of geospatial principles. Um, when, when you look at things from a different perspective, um, you may see things that, uh, you know, may not be evident from just one view of it democratize the use of geospatial, um, and reach those that, that are in need. Um, there are so many times where, um, you know, there is a absolute need for geographic understanding, but there's not the resources to provide that through a vendor's product. Um, I really, really am strongly in favor of in, in, um, increasing the range of skills, and certainly through the, uh, the instruction I've done, um, I, I hopefully students uh, have have uh, seen a much broader uh, understanding of, of what technology can do in the geospatial realm and just in general technology. And it's also joining a growing community. It really is a welcoming community. And it is only through the dedication and vision of Dr. Rafael Moreno that this program exists. And I, I absolutely have to thank him um, for his efforts. So what is uh, GEOG 4091-5091? Free and open source software for geospatial applications. It is a 15 week university level course. It's open to graduate and undergraduate students. It uh, talks about the theory of FOS4G as well as the practice. And we focus on three different areas. Um, you know, desktop, which is usually the easiest areas for those that have some kind of background in GIS to migrate into. Uh, databases, which um, to me is, is it, it's amazing how um, people that use GIS do not have a, a real strong grounding in databases, as well as cloud uh, web mapping. And it's taught at the beautiful campus of the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, in the past, I have taught uh, or instructed remote classes. Um, uh, going forward, it will probably be primarily remote, but it, it certainly is a uh, beautiful campus in the heart of uh, Denver, Colorado. So what is the, the UCD, the University of Colorado Denver infrastructure that we use? We have what is called the FAST Lab, Facility for Applied Spatial Teaching. 
um, and I'll show you a, a picture of this coming up. Um, it is a, uh, an amazing lab that has uh, so many different resources and, and, a, and a really dedicated staff to providing the very finest of um, spatial technologies across all different disciplines. So it, it, it is a centralized lab across all the different colleges. Um, we have the Canvas uh, content portal, um, which uh, materials are posted and um, communication is, uh, is, is conducted. Um, we have uh, Microsoft OneDrive, we have file servers. We are now, um, last semester, we were working with Postgres in an AWS environment. And certainly we have jump drives and individuals' personal um, laptops. Uh, the wonderful thing about instructing a FOSS 4G class, um, and um, it always makes me smile, is we do not have the worry of licensing. Uh, it is FOSS 4G, so we are free to implement um, this technology according to our, um, our abil ability and skills. So here is a picture of the Facility for Applied Spatial Teaching on the UCD campus. Um, this was the last time I was, I was in the facility uh, this last March before we, uh, we, we went off uh, to our own, uh, our own areas and uh, conducted a uh, a remote class. So it is an amazing facility. I mean, those are server grade computers that each uh, station has. And hopefully we'll be able to get back into that uh, facility again. So who, who is actually participating in this class? Um, it is a diverse educational background. We've got geography students, environmental science, computer science. We've got planning students. Um, and, and other, other uh, disciplines that have a, a relationship to something uh, geographical. Um, you know, we've got, we had some uh, geology students, um, we've had uh, international students, uh, so it, it, it is quite a diverse background. And that's what brings these students together. And, and you see in the class, um, really the, uh, the amazing, uh, uh, communication that happens between all these different disciplines. And that truly is what, what the beauty of geography and beauty of GIS is, is it brings together so many different areas of discipline. Um, we have undergraduate and graduate students, but they mostly are graduate. And um, I'll go a little bit more into the content of, of what the course uh, involves, but um, I am mostly familiar with instructing graduate students, so I expect that level of uh, maturity, and sometimes <laughs> it can be a, a, a challenge um, working with undergraduate students, but they've all been great, I, I tell you. It's all been great. Um, there, there can be some, some challenges. So it gets down to what the prerequisites are for this class. Um, a strict prerequisite for this course is introduction to geographic information systems or instructors improve uh, or instructors approval. Uh, does this always work? Um, I have a quote here, GIS is hard, according to James Fee, one of the great commentators in our industry. Um, talk a little bit more about him later, but uh, no, it doesn't always work. Um, there are some challenges uh, there, but the, for the vast majority of the times, it does work. You, but the key to instructing this course is you need to have some kind of basic understanding of how to work with geographic data, how to work with maps, and how to work with infrastructure that support geographic data and, and maps. So um, I, I have to say if uh, anybody has, uh, uh, any uh, uh, suggestions for how to work with challenging students? Um, that is always uh, always appreciated. So um, here is here is how I outline my course, and this is this is uh, evolved over a number of semesters, but I, th I think it works for me at least. Uh, we have two exams, uh, one at the midterm and one at the end. Um, we have ten lab assignments. Um, 
And graduate students have a little bit more extra challenging tasks for, for the lab assignments. Um, class participation is always a key. And, um, you know, that is broken down between undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, we haven't started to incorporate a graduate class presentation that, um, you know, unfortunately has been a little bit uh, difficult to manage uh, based on just kind of juggling time and, and resources, but uh, I think it is absolutely necessary. And in, in the previous, uh, my previous career at UCD, I always had a graduate presentation. That was key to the growth of the students and for them to understand that um, what they're doing and presenting that is 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 actually vital and communication is is a critical component of um, the, uh, the 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 learning experience um, and then we have an individual group class project um, most projects are individual uh, I, I absolutely uh, encourage students to come in with something that they have been working on, something they've been interested in, and uh, run with it. Use the technology that we're presenting in this course to actually fill it out and make it real for them in their, their class um, project. So part of the, um, the course is made up of the theory of phosphog. Uh, and I use a number of different um, resources. Um, there, there are great writings on Phos4G, how it's implemented, um, you know, from various different individuals. Uh, Adina Schutzberg uh, has 10 things you need to know about open source geospatial, um, quick and um, easy to, to grasp. You've got the G QGIS code of conduct. Very, very important when you're participating in this community that you know um, what the rules are um, and, and, and how the community is really based on the interactions of, of, of the individuals that, that participate. And then there are the academic um, papers, uh, open source geographic information systems, myth and realities, free and open source software for geospatial applications, mature alternative in the geospatial technologies arena. So I'm always looking for authoritative current and and you know some of the some of the materials I, I, I post are go back to the early 2000s. Some of them even earlier in, in, in the 20th century, because the principles really don't change that much. The actual application and the specifics of which technologies are being implemented, that certainly does change. So um, as, as, as another part of, of the course, incorporated into the 15-week course, I try to spend three weeks on desktop GIS. And this is the area where people that, uh, students that have um, background in vendor supplied uh, GIS really take off very quickly. They, they, they understand this very quickly. They can grasp it. Um, you know, they, it, I, I, I don't see many problems with um, the uh, instructing of a desktop GIS program. As we all know, the world is going to online, so um, that is much more important to um, emphasize in the future. But um, the desktop part is 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 pretty well solid. And one thing I absolutely have to thank is Kurt Menke for his book Discover QGIS 3.x. Um, it is probably one of the most complete books if you want to get a a, a view of QGIS um, across all the different um, technology areas that QGIS can um, uh, produce for you and, and you work with, um, it is well worth the cost. And, and Kurt is a great guy. Um, he's uh, done guest lectures for, me, for us. And again, I, I can't uh, recommend highly enough um, the QGIS book. Um, Yujaval uh, uh, Gandhi is also a really amazing resource, uh, GIS, QGIS tutorials, 
as well as uh, GIS Stack Exchange. And then the, the wealth, the incredible number of YouTube presentations um, is, is, is staggering. So what I do for the desktop part is, is, is I pick and choose. I can't go through all, what, 20 <laughs> chapters of this book, but I, I, I pick the, the main topic areas that I think that will give the students the most background and understanding that if they're ever challenged, I need to implement something in a free and open sourced environment. Oh, well, you know, I've used QGIS before. That's not a problem. I know what a, what a, a, a geodatabase is. I know, I know how to um, actually work with the tools and the technology. And so that's, that's kind of the goal of, of, of this part. Then we get to SQL and spatial SQL which is uh, <laughs> always pretty amazing, me, amazing to me, um, having uh, a, a long history in GIS and, and where databases and understanding the structure of databases and how to work with databases was really fundamental to the, to the early years of, of GIS. And um, that is much less um, emphasized it's much more the GUI, it's much more the, um, the interface and wizards and all those kind of things. And, and don't get me wrong, those, those aren't bad, but having a clear understanding of how to work with raw data tables and fields and data structures is absolutely critical, I think, to being a well-rounded GIS professional. So, um, I've searched around and for a number of years, I've used this www.sqlcourse2.com. There's SQL Course 1, but SQL Course 2. And it is the first introduction to SQL for most students. And it's, it, it, it's funny because I, I get, I don't know how many times students have said, why hasn't anybody ever taught me this? Why, why, why don't I know about this SQL business? It is so incredibly powerful. Um, so I find this course to be one of the, the most user-friendly because it's all online, all the tables are there, the answers are there, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really pretty well structured for someone who has never used a, a, a SQL interface. Um, and then we move to um, using spatial SQL. Because not only is SQL a challenge, um, we have the other hurdle, which is another quantum leap, which is spatial SQL, which um, the vast majority of SQL users have no idea what spatial SQL is. And, and I start with uh, uh, spatial light GUI. Um, I think this is a real good introduction. Um, it, it, it uses a variety of different um, data sources. Um, you can use a Spatialite um, uh, uh, database, um, which is a SQLite database. It uses a lot of the standard SQL. There's some things like typing and stuff that it doesn't do really well. Um, I'm looking for an update for uh, Spatialite GUI. Um, I haven't seen it in a long time. Uh, the, the gentleman out of uh, Italy is, is the one that put it together. And it is a great resource for just understanding data tables and spatial data without the map. And, and that's what my goal of this section of, of, of the course is, is you can do so much spatial processing, geospatial processing without any ever looking at a map. You have to be very careful because you can get very um, erroneous answers if you don't know what you're doing. But this is a good introduction and you can take it anywhere. Um, the downside on this is they do not have a Mac version of this. So um, it is only a window -based, uh, Windows based uh, product. So um, some of our Mac users um, uh, are kind of left out with that. Uh, the next thing is we jump into uh, databases. And this is where you now start to get a, a feel for how um, enterprise environment databases are constructed, some of uh, what the requirements are, um, and you know how you interface with with these data tables. Um, as as a lot of people say, um, PG admin is the interface for Postgres. 
and you um, place your post GIS extension onto that interface and then you can work with spatial tables in Postgres. Really, PG Admin is an administrator's tool. It is not so much a environment where you can learn um, SQL. It is somewhat daunting, um, even though it's 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 in a web browser. Um, it, uh, it 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 has its its uh, its its drawbacks. So that's why um, I I like to um, look at different options. And one I would really, really recommend, and one that um, has its own interface and is, can be somewhat taunting because it is a universal database um, interface, is dBeaver. Um, there's a community division, uh, edition that um, you can connect to Postgres databases, SQL Server databases, you can use uh, SpatialLite, uh, SQLite databases. Um, all different kinds of, of database you can connect to. So, and the thing that's nice about this is it does have the IntelliSense. So you can type along and it'll give you um, clues in which um, to, to actually construct your SQL code. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of, of, of dBeaver. And then, you know, if, if you do want to open the map, you've got your DB manager in QGIS. Um, that's pretty much a, a full-blown SQL uh, interface. Um, you can work with the tables, but in this part of the course, um, I really want to emphasize that you can do spatial GIS without any ever opening a map and without ever having a, a mapping interface. And it is truly, truly powerful. Um, some of the spatial SQL resources I found, um, one of the best was the Boundless course. Boundless Geo um, had a workshop, uh, Boundless Geo Post GIS Intro Index, and I know other instructors that, that have used these materials. Um, I can't find that any longer in the, um, on, on, the, on the internet. Um, I do have copies of it. I have copies of the data. It uses a, a, a very uh, compact uh, New York City database. So a lot of the, the spatial SQL resources um, that I use are you know, focused on New York City because that's, that's where they put together this truly, truly incredible um, uh, spatial uh, SQL uh, course using PostGIS, uh, PostGIS. Um, another good resource is Art Lembo. Um, he uh, has put together a number of uh, books on how do I do that in PostGIS. Um, he's a real big proponent of Manifold, uh, which I don't know too much about, but um, this, this is probably one of the other resources. And then, you know, you have to go out and find it on your own. Um, GIS Stack Exchange. Um, I am looking for other resources for understanding and putting together spatial um, uh, education materials using spatial databases specifically. And if anybody knows of those, please let me know. I'm, I'm more than willing to work with them. I've, I've put into, uh, together a number of resources based on Colorado and, and my local jurisdiction, but others, um, if, if they're available, certainly let me know. Ah, and then here's one area that I must say, just about every student struggles with. Nobody knows how to use a command line. I mean, it's, 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 it's shocking to me um, growing up, uh, meaning having my, my computer uh, teeth cut on, you know, using command line tools. It is very, very, very seldom instructed. So, um, I think it's absolutely vital that at least students get a, um, you know, an experience, <laughs> an experience, and that's what it is, with GDAL and OGR. Um, you know, just so they can see that this is an incredibly powerful tool and it basically runs a lot of stuff that you see out on the web. If you know GDAL, you know OGR, um, you can uh, produce incredible, incredible results um, with your data. 
So, and certainly in translation, clipping, all kinds of um, data manipulation. Um, I have not been successful with um, uh, getting students to actually implement this too much, but um, there are some interesting resources on that, uh, that front, um, and uh, I, I'm still, still interested in searching for, for ways to better instruct OGR and GDOT. So um, moving on, the third area of the 15 week, uh, 15 week course is cloud GIS. And uh, I have a homework uh, assignment to go through um, open source cloud uh, GIS providers and uh, pick one or two and rate their um, ability, uh, what their costs are, um, what their advantages are, what their disadvantages of, of them are. Um, some of them uh, included in this list is GIS Cloud, Cardo, uh, QGIS Cloud, uh, Mapbox, Amigo Cloud, NextGIS, and 3Liz. Are there others? Um, I'm certainly looking for others that um, students can, can take advantage of uh, and work with. Uh, most of them have a free uh, trial period in which um, you can work with these tools. Some of them have uh, pretty much unlimited um, resources um, for a very small usage. Um, so that's, that's another challenge. So students get an idea that um, there are these resources available. So, and, and the other area that I really like to focus on are guest speakers. Um, you know, a lot of times students don't get um, the uh, background on professionals that are in the field, that are working with these tools, um, and, uh, you know, making a living um, are, are able to survive using Phos4G tools. So uh, this, this uh, last semester we had James Fee, which is, uh, I mean, he is, he is a legend pretty much in the GIS industry, longtime GIS blogger, GIS, geospatial expert. Um, one thing about being in lockdown is, uh, you know, most people are hanging around at home. So if they have the time, they, 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 they are more than willing to uh, contribute. Uh, Matt Baker uh, at Denver Public Schools is truly an amazing resource in, in, in the FOS4G area. He's doing just incredible work uh, implementing that for Denver Public Schools. Ian Isaacs is uh, uh, the public manager for uh, Mapbox, gives us a, a vendor's um, a perspective. Jerry Mahanahop was a um, GIS consultant. And it's important, um, not everybody is uh, going to have a standard GIS job, and Jerry really brings a perspective to this industry, to the students, that the industry is so broad that you can pick and choose, and, and you can be very flexible in the kinds of things that you want to work with. And then Kurt Menke, who um, is uh, the owner and chief poobah of Bird's Eye Geospatial, a great guy, uh, always, always willing to contribute. So, um, and then we get into the projects, which um, is, is really built on the course of study. Um, I try to get students um, involved, get a personal interest. Many of the students are working on graduate programs and they're transitioning into, um, you know, getting their thesis put together. Um, and and their their reporting and and other other students uh, want to make hiking maps in Colorado, which is just fine, just as long as they're they're engaged and interested. Sometimes I will assign a, a, a project, but as long as they're engaged and interested and in using the technology to produce results that um, you know the the, the geography uh, demands. So. Um, a report is required along with um, their methodology steps, um, how they approached um, the project. Um, sometimes it could be maps, sometimes it could be data sets, and sometimes it can be a, a web applications. So here is, here's an example, and this is just a very, very small sampling, and um, I had a student 
who was working on glaciers in Patagonia. And he had done some field work down there. Um, and he really said QGIS uh, saved his project. Um, it, 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 you know, having to get uh, vendor licenses uh, was, was really, really a problem for him. Um, he was uh, uh, quite involved and did an incredible amount of digitizing, uh, more than I probably would have uh, for his project. But this was, this was really, really a stellar project too. Um, another one was um, using the CARDO program to do habitat loss in Utah based on um, you know, various different uh, resizing of uh, these uh, national monuments. Um, excellent, excellent project. And, um, and this was one that's just, just one, every once in a while you get, get one of these projects that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, this this uh, student is planning on uh, kayaking the Inside Passage in Alaska. And he made a series of 46 maps that he will take in his kayak that have all the campgrounds, the buoys that he's going to be using, the lat long uh, locations, um, and, and truly, truly amazing. And this is just a small sampling. There was another project that I didn't include here that was, that was really, really interesting. Um, the city of Rocky Ford in Colorado, um, we, we helped to in, uh, implement a utility project down there. And, um, you know, because of the COVID, we haven't been able to be as engaged as we like. Um, there's been other, other things, um, uh, uh, other impediments in the way to a full implementation. But, I mean, we put together a whole, whole utility data set and, and a structure for them. So these are just some of um, the projects that students, students have put together. And it's always the project that, uh, you know, I have to say, keeps me coming back because they're, they're always so in, inspirational what students do. Um, they really take it on. Um, so some of the challenges, um, you know, one of the things that, 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 that is difficult and why GIS is hard is you need to have a sense for your data. Um, you need to have so much uh, understanding of projections and completeness and normal forms of databases. Um, that some students don't have a data sense. They're, they're lost in the, the, the blizzard of, of information that we have at our fingertips now. I, I mean, there is so much data out there. It is really our, our uh, challenge to, to make sense of it. Um, aversion to code. I mean, I tell you, there's some students, um, they specifically, quote unquote, I hate code. Um, and that is a challenge for us, but it's certainly an opportunity because the world runs on code and yes, they will not be coders, but um, in a course like this, you need to have some kind of, okay, I'm gonna buckle down and I'm gonna do the uh, multi-form algebra and just get this code uh, cranked out. So that's another challenge. We need to have a serious grounding in geodesy. Um, I have students that have take introductory courses um, that really don't understand differences in projections, what you can do with projections. So a lot of my course, I have to review that. I have to review how you, even though, you know, there's projection on the fly, that can absolutely be dangerous when you're doing geoprocessing. Database structures is a challenge. How to understand databases, how to understand how databases are um, properly formatted, um, you know, especially when you're doing table joins. Uh, you know, introductory classes don't give you left outer joins and inner joins and full unions and all those kind of things. They, they, they give you a GUI in which you, um, you know, work with. Uh, what are the self-learning styles? Because really in FOS4G, we are talking about self-learning. We're talking about, I know this can work. I got to make this work. I'm going to make this work. 
Um, so the self-learning styles and, and boy, I've, I've been in that camp a lot of times. And also what are our challenges going forward with distance learning? Um, how do we format, um, conform uh, students' expectations to environments that um, are totally distance learning? And they're, I mean, I've done distance learning for full semesters back in the 2000s. I didn't have a problem. But going forward, um, we, 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 need to, we need to take a look at that. So I'm also looking for resources. Um, Geotech Center um, is a resource. Uh, it has a lot of good background information. Um, it really is vendor centric, which I, I walk that line. Um, I don't know if it's, it's, if it's, uh, you know, I, I just struggle with, with vendor centric um, uh, resources like this. And maybe I shouldn't, but um, really geography should be open to all formats. And I think Geotech Center should be a, um, you know, an open and welcoming, welcoming environment. Geo for All is another resource. Um, what I would propose is, is we put some of these most current and valuable technologies um, on this so that students can draw from this and, and have much more of a um, curated, uh, standardized um, learning exper um, experience. So my questions for you are, what resources do you use to instruct an introduction to FOS4G course? What materials do you use to instruct the theory of FOS4G? What lessons do you use to instruct hands-on practice of FOS4G? And how do you or will you handle remote learning when infrastructure, um, when the infrastructure is the student's responsibility? And that's what I see going forward. Um, it'll be a student with a laptop with a Postgres uh, database installed, QGIS, and other, um, you know, software that is going to be their responsibility for installing, which to me is really the key to learning FOS4G. Um, if you can install this, you can make this stuff work, you can make this stuff talk to each other, then um, you know you are 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 well over the the battle of of learning this stuff. So I just want to say um, special thanks to all the people who made and released these awesome resources for free. Um, the presentations were made by Slar Slides Carnival, Kurt Menke, Bird's Eye View GIS, University of Colorado uh, GES, James Fee, and all those really dedicated individuals and organizations that make FOS4G possible. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to you. Raphael, um, do you have any questions, thoughts, comments? Anybody left on the uh, call? <laughs> Fantastic, Dave. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to stop sharing so that we can uh, probably yes. uh, see the folks? I think we got for the recording your, your contact information there. Uh, and again, uh, as you can see, um, you can see why we are very lucky that, that Dave is, is part of the faculty in the Department of Geography and Environmental Sciences with us. Uh, truly a, a great contribution, as you can see through the content and way he delivers this area of GI science and technology. So, Dave, at this point, do you prefer the, the folks uh, turn on their mic and ask directly or? Sure. Okay, H how about that? So, if anybody has a comment or a question, if you could feel free to jump in, turn in your mic, turn on your mic and go for it. Hi, this is uh, Václav. I have uh, a question about uh, the course uh, as you are teaching it. Is it, uh, is it mandatory or is it uh, elective for the students? How does it work? It's, it's an elective. Okay, so, uh, so like, do students, do you have like a lot of, do you feel you have enough students who want to Take it so they are motivated to take the course. Um, I never feel I have enough students. <laughs> um, I, last semester I had 10. Uh, one semester I had 15. Uh, one semester I think I had six or seven. So it, it does vary. I don't know. 
Um, here in America, uh, you know, this, this, this is not the most direct way to get a job. I, I, I just have to say that. It's, it's a very, very important field for understanding, um, you know, geography. But if students just want to get a job, they have to st study their vendor's materials, which is, which is pretty sad, I, I, I think. But um, it is an elective course. Uh, I feel that um, I try to promote it as much as possible. I try to integrate as much as possible all various different technologies. But, um, you know, here in America, it's, uh, it's somewhat different. And if may I make a quick comment to Barclav's question. Barclav, also, and everyone, to, to keep in mind that the University of Colorado Denver has a total population of about uh, 13,000 students, grads and undergrads. So courses that make for 10, 15 uh, are well-attended classes, uh, yeah. particularly elective classes, which are above and beyond the requirements. That's a well-attended class. Yeah, just a, just a comment to contextualize the answer. Thank you. You know, and and, and, and Vaclav, I I just wanted to say that there has been talk about integrating, you know, commercial products and open source products. Um, I think it would be too much right now for students. Um, in some of the projects, some of the students have used commercial products. Uh, right now, we're throwing so many new concepts to the students. Just the, just the database concept is, is almost overwhelming for a lot of them. So um, there has been talk about that blending of, of, of different uh, uh, technologies, and this is really a technology course. So I, I don't know if anybody's had experience with that. Well, let's, if, uh... If I can speak again, uh, that's what uh, uh, we do at NC State, or Helena Mitasheva specifically is doing at NC State for her graduate level course. But it's a, it's not a GIS course; it's a geospatial modeling course. And modeling. Uh, she is teaching uh, Grass GIS and ArcGIS in parallel. So the students use both, um, but they use only, uh, let's say, I guess one package from each group, right? Like one open source package and one proprietary. And this is Shannon Albeck from the University of Wyoming. Um, and and the, the continue on what Vashik was talking about. It's uh, I, I do a course also with Arc Pro and R in, in simultaneously for an intro to GIS course for, for grad students and just making them do the same work and processes with both pieces of software just to give them experience uh, um, from both commercial and open source uh, approaches seems to be okay. I mean, some folks grad, uh, gravitate towards the GUI and others uh -huh. really enjoy the repeatable workflows that you can generate with, with the scripting language. So, yes, um, yes. I have a, a quick question, and I want to take the the, the, oppor the opportunity for, uh, to have you here, Dave, as well as I can see other folks from other universities that are involved in 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 phosphor education. So, what, uh, Dave? What what do you consider to be the top three priorities that will enhance or facilitate the delivery of education of the two things you mentioned, the principle of phosphor G? and uh, the application and use of Phos4G. So what do you consider to be some things that, that are uh, in, in need uh, uh, for, for enhancement? Um, if, if you could have uh, an authoritative curated uh, theory uh, discussion versus um, a bunch of different papers that come from different, different areas, um, I think having some kind of credential, uh, this is geo for all approved or something like that, where people go to this resource 
and they work on this content and you know it is it is given the blessing by all the different people that are working in this area versus me trying to figure out how to get the best theory information but also they have the best content information like i said um i think kurt menke's qgis book is probably one of the best resources in that topic but there's sem many other topics so um Coordination and communication and curation of this content, I think, is absolutely one of the most important. And then people will recognize that this technology is, is really something that they can use. They, 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 can, they can leverage in, in their environment. So. Thank you. I think AI, M, uh, you have your mic on. Do you have a question? Yeah. Go. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Yeah, yeah. I think we me, we might miss you. If you're if you're talking, we cannot hear you. Can you try again? Okay. Uh, yes. I uh, I'll, I'll come on board again. Yeah. Thanks for the lecture, sir. Uh, I. I have an observation and then show comment, and then I will also put a form of questions. Uh, number one is uh, the grading system that was shown in your indication of a final exam. If I have to compare what you presented as what happens in US with uh, part of our home module here that we are using, I'm coming, calling from a uh, staff of University of Lagos, Lagos State, Nigeria. Uh -huh. the of uh, surveying and geoinformatics. Uh, the courses we are taking at the undergraduate and postgraduate. So we also have the Department of Geography, VIGIS, who will also be taken by students. Observation from the slide is that uh, undergrading, Education of that uh, you are examining the student through uh, a final, you only have assignments and so on like that. Is there is there no room for final exam throughout the whole program, or uh, it's just something that happens uh, or is not happening frequently? Uh, number two is. Uh, just as you said, the open source software, they are there, but then uh, if the people are not aware of them, the resources will also not be available and then it will not be open again. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you have to help the community also uh, to give us a list of uh, all those, uh, where we can get those resources from. Uh, then number three, uh, is the uh, data structure being taught? Is it at the undergraduate or postgraduate level? For instance, I'm in charge of uh, spatial data structure at uh, a master's level in my university here. I just want to have an idea. Do you go down to have it at the undergraduate level? Despite the fact that uh, the initial part of the year is common at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. Uh, for special data structure, as I'm combining my idea or the node with that one that you created, is it at the undergraduate level or majorly at the postgraduate level? And then uh, I've talked about the resources. Maybe you give a light or where we can easily get those uh, resources so that uh, the more we have them, the better they are for us. So in our own case here, we didn't make it mandatory for students to use the open source. It depends. Uh, most of them, they are used to S3 product. Some of them can use uh, Geomatica and so on and so forth. These are not open source. Uh, they, are, they are vendor based or they are commercial. But uh, it's interesting. I've taken some notes also to share with students 
particularly the area of that assignment that you said you, you are giving to student. I bet it's operating system is just like mine. Was due to student, they have to come back to present to this, and then they have some other uh, word object that you have to use at the GIS applications to different uh, areas of uh, human endeavor. So these are my comments. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I okay. think uh, we have a lot to learn from your expertise and then uh, to crossbreed uh, your knowledge, perhaps if possible, we are on holiday now, perhaps if students are on campus, we can also organize, talk to them, and then perhaps we can ask you to come on board to have a chat with them, if that would be uh, uh, okay by you, sir. Thanks very much for your presentation. It's Thank very you. interesting one. Um, to, to answer your question, uh, there is not a final comprehensive exam for the pr that I know of for the program, um, I have a final exam in my course. Um, community resources again um, is is our challenge. I think I think we can work together on these to come up with a standard curriculum. Um, and again, this this is an introductory course, meaning um, students don't have a strong computer science database management background. They may have some skills in one, one area or another, but it's, it's geared to the individual that has geographic knowledge, um, that has domain knowledge, that wants to apply the technology to that domain. Um, it really is a undergraduate um, data structures kind of uh, uh, instruction for this. So kind of what I have to say on that. Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's it. Thank you, sir. Th th thank you. Thank you. I, I, I am, uh, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us for all the way from Lagos, I understand. Yes. Um, and um, okay, guys, we have uh, time for one more question or comment. Or, okay, so just uh, we have several uh, comments in the chat that, that will be part of the posting in terms of thanking you for your presentation. Uh, so folks had to leave because they have uh, meetings uh, after this one. So if not, Dave, again, uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this very interesting presentation. I think that will be very useful for the recording for many folks uh, around the world. And everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and, and for your uh, participation and, and thoughts. And uh, so at this point, I will stop.